today's video, we talk about the Galaxy Z Fold 3. Is it time for this to be a mainstream device? Or is there still issues with it that hold it back? That's what we're discussing today. So major improvements with generation three of the Galaxy Z Fold 3. There's several things. It is iterative design compared to generation two where Samsung fixed a lot of the problems with the original generation. But with this generation, with generation three, what has improved is durability. There's S Pen support, higher refresh rate on the front cover screen, and a new camera on the inside that we'll all get into and discuss further. So first off, let's go over specs in case you don't know it. IPX8 rated now. What that means is the hinge here has grommets or coverings inside of it to help it be water resistant. It is not dust resistant. That's just because of how this hinge works. There still can get dust in it. So they haven't figured out yet how to resolve that. Gorilla Glass Victus is being used on the front panel. Uh, of course, it's a different kind of glass on the inside. It's a flexible type of very, very thin glass. So it's not that Victus glass on the inside. So your durability is still significantly lower than a normal phone or the outside screen. But so far from my two weeks of use, it is vastly better than the second generation. And the film that they're using on the inside is way less prone to smudges or eventual bubbling that happened on the generation two. The screen size is still the same. The cover screen is a 6.2 inch screen, while the internal is a 7.6 inch screen. The cameras, front selfie camera is a 10 megapixel. The interesting camera is a under screen camera that is four megapixels. Samsung went with this to make the experience of the inside of the, or the main screen more interactive. They determined that a bunch of their statistics that they did, not many users were using the inside camera that much. So they put it under the screen to help increase the experience of the larger screen. Now, what I would recommend this camera on the internal being used for is pretty much just for online meetings or something like that. It's not really even good enough for selfie quality. That's where you would use the back ones or the front ones. So with the meetings, it's good for that because you can use the fold mode where you set it up on end and then you can use that camera at that point. There is three rear cameras. The cameras haven't changed from generation two. It's the only thing that kind of was a little bit of a letdown to me. I was hoping that they would upgrade the cameras a little bit, but Samsung on both the flip and the fold really wanted to focus on getting the price down this year. And if you order from Samsung, you also get a lot of incentives. By the way, you can trade in multiple devices to get the cost down. There's lots of ways to get the cost of this very expensive phone down to a normal phone that you would buy a normal high-end phone, your $700 to $1,000 phone. So the cameras on the back are an ultra wide 12 megapixel, a 12 megapixel wide camera, and a 12 megapixel telephoto camera that does 3X zoom. And then past that is digital. The battery is a 4,400 milliamp battery. So in comparison to the S21, 
Ultra. This is a little bit smaller battery, but you do have to consider that they're fitting the battery in two sides of this design. So just because of real estate, you're of course being slimmed down on battery to accommodate this very thin profile. And then as far as memory and storage, there's two options. Both come with 12 gig of RAM and the, store, the internal space that you can use is 256 gig or 512 gig. So some of the really big things that stand out with this device now is the support of the S Pen. There is a couple different pens actually that you can use for this, so be aware of which pen you use. Make sure you get the one that either says, I don't know if this will show up, but it will say Fold Edition on it. The Fold Edition pen actually has pressure sensitive in the pen to help reduce the tear on the internal screen. And then there is a Pro pen that's a, quite a bit bigger and brings back the gesture features that you had with the Note and can also connect to multiple devices. I think having the S Pen this year is really the key point in making this device really worth it. But I am a very advocate fan of the pen. I always really like the Note series. I like the S21 as well. Obviously, the, my only complaint with the S21 Ultra and even this is there's nowhere to put the pin. There's a case that you can get from Samsung. It's not great because of the cover is flimsy on it. It's not magnetic. Um, so really, I, I'll use alternative cases typically and just keep the pin, pin in my pocket. Hit me up in the comments if you know any way to get a clip on these pins. I think that would really be a good idea. The S Pen supports all the normal features of the hovering cursor, of the writing um, using Samsung Notes or other note-taking apps like OneNote. Uh, you can navigate through the OS. Uh, there is some additional features now that if you are on a URL or a text field box, you can hover your pen over it and write directly on that box. One thing that is admitting from the S Pen features is the S Pen does not work on the front screen. I wish they would have included that as well so that you could have jotted down quick notes on the front screen and then if you wanted to take longer detailed notes you could then flip it open and then have a larger canvas. But what I do really like utilizing the fold over let's say the S21 is just the sheer real estate for writing notes down. This feels much more like a notepad size document to where I have plenty more real estate to actually write out my notes. I actually have been utilizing this daily instead than a notepad or a different form of a tablet, maybe an iPad or my Surface. Instead, because it's just so much portable, so much more portable, I can take this to meetings and I can easily use it to write down my notes and still look at my email because of the multitasking features. Speaking of the multitasking features, this is the major thing with the Fold. And this is why the Fold is different than the Flip. Primarily because of this big internal screen that you get, you can utilize splitting the middle of the screen and using multiple apps. You can even have four apps open. You can use quadrants on the top and the bottom. You can even throw another app in the middle, like say your text message or watch a video or something. You have a lot of capabilities of multitasking with this device compared to your normal phone where at most you would do two apps and feel very crunched on space. If one of those apps needed keyboard input, then it's overlapping over that bottom app that you can't even use. Where all of this in this device works significantly better. There's even a floating keyboard that you can use when you're multitasking which makes it easy to move the floating keyboard in and out of the way of the other apps so you can still see them. There's a lot of capabilities with the multitasking. 
And with the multitasking is a feature to, to even use the multitasking even more, which is the edge panel. And one of the key features that works with the Fold 3 is you can do app pairing. So when you slide out your edge panel, you can then have two apps paired together that you can instantly click and then it does split screen view and aligns them perfectly without you having to drag them over and then align them or move them back and forth. So that's a really key feature of the Fold 3 and the Edge, edge panel now. The other feature which was introduced in the last generation but due to the hinge being better this generation the flex mode works slightly better. You still get about the same degrees of rotation that you did before, um, but the flex mode is there again. This is another big feature of the fold. This is something that the flip has as well, and I showed off some of the features of the flip with the flex mode, and similar situations can occur with the flex mode on the Fold 3 where you can, for example, be on YouTube, have the video playing on top, and then it cuts the bottom portion off to show the comments or any other videos that you could choose. One of the other great things about this device that I have found very nice is gaming on it. There's Android apps that can take advantage of the bigger screen, just try your main ones, and see impact, however you want to pronounce it. Um, that is one that does it. Uh, the larger real estate is really nice with uh, Call of Duty. Or, personally, my favorite is leveraging a cloud gaming system like Xbox Game Pass or even Stadia. These are both browser or app-based cloud gaming solutions. There's GeForce Now as well. And these work very, very well. I've done gaming on as recently as the new Xbox exclusive called 12 Minutes. That's a very great game to play on something like this. You can play much faster paced games than that, of course, on Xbox Game Cloud. It just all depends on your connection at that point. But if you have a good stable connection and high enough bandwidth, then this device is great for doing cloud gaming on as well. So to end this, the main thing that I want to preface it is to state the versatility that this device brings. Sure, it's a little heavier than your typical phones and obviously due to the price, you're probably gonna more likely put a case on this than any other device you've ever thought of and that will add a little bit more bulk to it as well. Stay tuned, I'm gonna do an accessory videos on this to show you some great accessories to get. I also have a accessory video up there um, from last year. A lot of those accessories will work with this one as well. But at the end of the day, the versatility of this is what makes this my daily driver now because there's so much you can do with it. Till the next one. See you guys.